Well, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, and uh, first of all, I'm so honored and delighted to be here in such a great event. Uh, um, and again, it gives me a lot of energy to see if people are caring for other people, and they are coming on Saturday afternoon to a conference, and uh, they're day off. And that means a lot for me. Um, the other things that they asked me to talk about is sleep in dementia. They choose it specifically uh, the time of the lecture after lunch. Yeah. <laughs> then that means if you guys wanted to take a nap, feel free, because the, the discussion that we're going to have this afternoon, um, you're going to get bored, and that's a good time for you to have some nap. Uh, by the way, there's a tons of study shows having siesta or nap for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, 20 minutes, very, very useful for our body. And that's why, again, this is medical advice. Feel free. <laughs> um, now, we're going to talk about sleep and dementia. For sure, there is no point, I mean, there's no way that I can talk about everything about sleep physiology and knowing about the brain, how the things going on with the sleep and dementia patient um, in detail. That probably needs a half a day because when, when I teach about a sleep, it usually takes a lot of things that we need to discuss about the brain, but I try to make it. Um, I do my best, actually, to make it so simple that you guys have just a quick understanding why dementia people, they have a problem with the sleep. And I'm sure that you guys already have this experience with a lot of patients that you're taking care of. Now, uh, what we're going to talk today, first, we got, first of all, before we actually say that I have uh, no financial disclosure to any company, I just get my paycheck at, from Stanford. I did some consult for some company, but none of the topic that I talked today has been actually uh, supported by any uh, company. Now, we're going to talk about a sleep change with aging. I'm sure nobody's going to argue with me that there's definitely some change with sleep and aging. Some of you guys have this experience as well. We're going to talk about a sleep change with dementia today. We're going to talk specifically about brain circadian rhythm, one of the uh, most important things that we know more in physiology of sleep. And then we're going to talk about the strategies to improve the sleep in dementia patient, which is going to be very, very difficult. Now, you agree with me, is that sleep is the most part of our life. Actually, uh, if, you, if you think that you sleep eight hours a day, I, I, I wish that I can sleep eight hours a day, and you, you're calculating in 365 a day in a year, and in your years of of living, which is going to be 100 years, one third of your life you spend in the sleep. And that means that's a very, very important part of your life. Aging can change two things in the sleep. Not only can change actually the timing of the sleep, but also a structure inside the brain can be changed because of the sleep. And again, the sleep is the main challenge for a majority of caregivers, which I'm, I'm sure you guys are agree with me. In, in caring for dementia patients. But I want to bring a brief, brief question here. Is sleep, it's a problem of patient or it's a problem of caregivers? <laughs> have you ever had any demented patients come to you and say, I have a sleeping problem? <laughs> or come to bring to the doctor and say, how are you asleep? It's I sleep well. But when you, when you ask the caregiver, then you find there is a lot of problem. Let me give you some cases here. Let's talk about it more. The first case is actually a case that um, and, and a nurse called me at, let me just uh, change that one to, that would be better. Okay. The first case is uh, the, the, the nurse called me from memory care that the patient is, the dementia patient usually goes to bed around 6 p.m and wake up around 2 a.m. in the morning. And, and that's, then they call, and this is, this is a very normal, this is a very, very common cause that the physician get that should be applied in sleep medication. If you calculate the hours, is it a bad habit to sleep at 6 a.m. Yeah. and uh, at 6 p.m. and wake up at 2 a.m.? Yeah, yeah it's, it's actually okay. But the other thing is the dementia patient is, uh, again, the sleep is a very fragmented. It's only like one to two hours. But when you calculate during the day, you will find the person actually sleeping for around 12 hours a day. I want to tell you a very, very um, uh, interesting example of a sleep. I, I was in nursing home, and I, was, I got a call from like 8 p.m. from the nurse told me that a patient is not sleeping and asking for a sleeping medication. 
And I said, well, let me come tomorrow and visit the patient. I went in the morning and visited the patient. He was sleeping. And then I went to see other patients in the unit. It was almost close to 12 before I just go back to Stanford. I had my lunch in the nursing home, and I just again went back to check the person still sleeping. And I asked the nurse, just please have somebody from your CNA watch this guy and make sure right up all the numbers that he's sleeping. Find out he's actually sleeping for 13 hours. But he woke up at around 8 p.m. Having dinner and said, well, I can't sleep right now. Can you give me some sleeping meditation? <laughs> now, this is the biggest problem that we have, which is true. What is the definition of a sleep problem? I think if we can have this conversation, then we can solve a lot of problems. Now, what's going to be the consequence of a sleep problem in dementia patient? You tell me. What's, what, if, this, if you think the dementia patient is not a sleeping, what do you think is going to happen? What's the complication may happen to them? Can you tell me? What is that? Agitation. Agitation, yes. What else? Confusion, Confusion. yes. What else? Noise. What? Noise. Noise, yeah, okay. Wow. But it's going to be a consequence of a sleep uh, dementia patient not a sleeping, or that's the reason that they're not a sleeping, but we'll talk about it. Why what else you expect that the dementia patient if it's not a sleeping, please? Absolutely, that's kind of like agitation, wandering. What else you can you can have a risk of the dementia patient not slipping in the institute and memory care? Fall. Fall, absolutely. One of the major cause of fall in dementia care, memory care, all around the world is actually not slipping at night, darkness, and then we have some problem. Depression, anxiety. The majority of things that we talk, that here, fall is one of them, caregiver burden, actually I put it on the number two, which is very, very important. Um, and cognitive decline. There is a there is a big, lot of articles. I didn't put all the articles on the slide, but if you look at the articles in the PubMed, there is a lot of the articles showing that less sleeping definitely has effect on on, a, on, on the cognitive uh, decline. And this is also for normal people, not 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 non dementia patient. And you hear a lot that not a sleeping well during your life may increase the chance of mild cognitive insufficiency also in the future. The other thing is sundowning. And this is one of the most important things that we will talk about it today. Agitation, confusion, you were absolutely right. And again, a lot of the dementia patients, if they're living at home, they ended up to go to memory care because of not sleeping, and the depression is one of them. Now, knowing that, I'd like to know a little bit more about the sleep cycle, that this is something that you guys are all know about that. We have a different stage of the sleep, and that's the way we can understand what does it mean to sleep. First, we feel drowsy. This is like close to 8 p.m., and then we go to the bed around 11. And think about you went to the bed right now, and then you wanted to sleep. There's a multiple stage. Two stages is non-rapid eye movement, which you hear about that, and the rapid eye movement to sleep. This is a two major cycle in the sleep. Non-rapid eye movement of sleep has a different stages. Stage one, it's still your very light sleep. This is still the time if somebody calls you over the phone or somebody texts you on your cell phone, you're able to turn and actually still answer the question or, or maybe know is in the neighborhood, you still have your attention. But then you go to a stage two and a stage three, which actually your sleep's gonna be more deep. And this is something that we all love to have some deep sleep because when we age, that part of the deep sleep is actually going to be less. But what happened in stage two and in stage three, we're going to be more in the deep sleep. Everything that you have a dream in this stage, you're not going to remember it in the morning. And then cycle goes to rapid eye movement of sleep, which actually in this cycle, your body gets paralyzed. And then you have a lot of the dreams at that. And you know why the body should be paralyzed at that uh, period? Which is a very smart thing. Because think about, if your body is not paralyzed, you're going to acting out every dream that you're going to have at night. If, so if you think some, some danger is following you in your dream, you're going to stand up and you're going to run. We're going to talk about it, the people that have REM behavioral sleep disorder. This is exactly the problem that they have. Their body not able to get paralyzed. And it's, but that's why whatever they see in the sleep, they're going to acting out. <clears throat> and that cycle will repeat 90 minutes to every 110. Amazing physiology. And that's going on during the till morning. When we go to the morning, we have more rapid eye movement. That's why our sleep is more shallow and, and, and during the toward the morning time in compared to the first hours of the night. The sleep and aging, definitely there's some change here. 
decrease total time of sleep. Now, as we're getting older, no matter how healthy you are, the total time of sleep is going to be less. Then that's number one. We have more lighter and fragmented sleep. We will talk about it why. And we have definitely decrease in the stage three, which is the deepest part of your sleep. We have decrease in rapid eye movement to sleep. And that's one of the things in dementia patient is actually worse. That's why they have more agitation, wandering at nighttime, and we'll talk about it more. And we have earlier the sleep onset. And we'll talk about why we have, we go to bed more earlier when we're actually getting older. And we are actually wake up more earlier when we're actually getting older. And this change, the only thing that's happened after 50 years old, is actually starting from 30 years old and gradually build up in the years. Because everybody says, oh, I'm 30, I'm fine. But no, we're starting. <laughs> <laughs> now, how about dementia? Definitely, there is a severe change in the sleep the structure. And if what happened is, I will talk to you about, they have more and longer actually awakening at that time. Increase the stage one, which is a very, very, I told you, very, very shallow sleep. That's why this dementia patient, they are very sensitive to the noise. More than non-dementia person. And that's something you need to learn about, and why noise is a very important thing. They actually have a significant decrease in the rapid eye movement. When we have less significant decrease in rapid eye movement, they quickly change the cycle, and that's why they have fragmented the sleep. They wake up more. And I will tell you again, a very interesting example that I actually found in my son, who is actually a toddler. He has the same pattern. And again, they have disabled, absolutely not circadian rhythm that is working well. And in vascular dementia, we, we have some theory behind that, but we know that people with vascular dementia, they have more sleep breathing problem. That's why the risk of the sleep apnea it's more on the vascular dementia patient. And when you look at the Parkinson or Lewy body dementia, which is a kind of like Parkinsonism picture, you see that they have more red or rapid eye movement behavioral disorder, and they have more awakening actually during the day. And this is a very, very important thing that you need to know about them. And again, at the end, the people that have Parkinson, because of this change, they have more sleep attack you see the Parkinson people, or the people who have Lewy body during the day, they suddenly go like this. And that's a sleep attack. It's kind of like not narcolepsy that we're talking in sleep apnea, but they have more sleep attack during the daytime. And while well, everything is happening, now understanding why this is very important to know, is understanding your brain. If you know your brain, you're able to kind of understand what's going on, what's wrong, and what's wrong with the dementia patient that you have. This one thing that we talk about, brain circadian rhythm, amazing things that we know for many years, but now we have more information about that. Brain has a master clock, and this is very, very important. Not only our brain has it, all the animals, all the plants, all the microbes, all the organisms in, in the world, they have a master brain clock. And this is very important because if you even see on the, like a fish in an aquarium inside the house, you see your cat inside the house or dog, they have the same master brain clock. They know what time is day and what time is night. And that's something that we know in the brain. Everything is actually located in this picture. Amazing physiology of the brain. When you see this picture, you see the light going to your eyes. And in the back of your eye, there is something we call retina. And retina gets the message of light during the day, all the way goes to a places that we call SCN or suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is very, very important part. And all the receptors goes to somewhere inside the brain we call pineal body. You don't need to know all the details, but pineal body is the center produce your natural melatonin. And that natural melatonin is exactly telling you this is the nighttime. This is the time to ready to sleep. This is not the time that you need to go out and do work up. Or this is the time you kind of need to calm down. This is what we call brain circadian rhythm. So a lot of things can be changed because melatonin is actually our timing messenger, a big timing messenger in your body. What happens is the melatonin goes to every single cell in your body, to a heart, to the kidney, to the GI, to your skin, and say, hey, knock the door. It's the sleep time. You need to sleep. This is exactly the time that you feel very drowsy and you're ready for yourself to go to the bed. This is amazing things about physiology of melatonin. And then what happens is melatonin produces at night. It goes up on the night. 
But what is stimulating the light that you're getting during the day? is increase the melatonin later of the night. And again, what happened is what, whatever happened in the change of secretion of melatonin, that's why you're going to have a change in the sleep cycle. Uh, the other thing which is very interesting here, which I wanted to show how the melatonin work, think about around like we're living in West Coast, we're living in California, we're not talking about Alaska or, or, or Scandinavian country or somewhere else. We're talking about the place that we have sunrise at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning, and we have sunset around 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Melatonin is actually going up when the light and outside, it becomes more dim. And that's why melatonin starts to increase. Around like 8 p.m., you see melatonin has a very peak going up all the way around 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. It's going to be in the highest amount in your bloodstream. This is the time you have your deepest sleep. And when you see that around like 4 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning, melatonin starts to drop so quickly, that's the time your body is ready to wake up. And then you're able to wake up. And it's still around like 7 o'clock in the morning, melatonin goes to flat, goes to very, very low level in your body. Now I wanted to show you a very interesting thing about brain circadian rhythm. This is us. This is the way that we live in 24 hours. If you know that, then you can understand your dementia patient much better. Let's just start from here, around like, I will say probably around 2100, and you have also on the other side. Think about 9 o'clock at the night, that your melatonin is going to be very high. At midnight, focus on the picture on the midnight. In the midnight, the, if everything is dark, you are in your deep sleep. What happens is, the first thing melatonin does, ask your GI system and your urinary system to calm down. Because think about if you have no less melatonin in your system, you're going to spend entire night in the bathroom. That's very a smart thing to ask to stop that. That's one of the reasons. You can think about it. Why my dementia patient, they go more to the bathroom? Because they don't have this cycle. No, but with the non-dementia patient, that is ask them to stop. And then at midnight, you go to the deepest sleep. You are at 2 o'clock in the morning, you are very good. I will show you in the picture, melatonin actually has a reverse with the low body temp with the body temperature. What does it mean? When melatonin is on the peak, your body temperature is start to drop. The core body temperature. That's the reason. Have you ever noticed in your bed you lip you left the blanket on the on the on the end of the bed, but you see in the morning you put the blanket on your body. Because at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock you feel cold and you take the blanket on. And you don't remember that. But your body becomes so cold around 4 o'clock in the morning because melatonin is going to be 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Melatonin is going to go down. Around the morning, you are awake. It's still, you have the melatonin. This is the sharpest rise in your blood pressure. If somebody check your blood pressure, this is actually a good time. I recommend to a lot of my patients do it after you wake up because you can see the peak of your blood pressure in your body. And then you're starting to start your day. What happens is your ball will move in the start because melatonin is going to go down and you're going to go to the bathroom. You still kind of feel drowsy. That's why you still see a lot of hearing about accidents in the highway in the morning, because you still have some melatonin in your brain, brain your blood stream. That's why you're not able to make a good decision. Around 10 o'clock in the morning, all melatonin is gone, and you are very, very sharp. That's why if they wanted to examine you, they do it at around 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning. They don't ask you for the 6 o'clock in the morning, because you're still very sleepy. And at 10 o'clock in the morning, you are really good on that. You go to the noon, and then you're very alert. You have the best coordination around like early afternoon. I'm always joking with my students. If you want to break up with your partner or make a very important financial decision, do it in the early afternoon, because you are very well concentrated in your brain. And then, then you have a good reaction time. Very interesting, around like 3 o'clock to 5 p.m., you have the highest cardiovascular capacity that's why a lot of doctors tell you is the best time for exercise. Okay. Go to the gym. Around early afternoon, like 3 p.m. to 5, you can see on the slide, around like it's still 5 p.m., 17. You have greatest cardiovascular. Now, what happened is that around the evening time, melatonin is going to start to pick, going up and having secretion. You have the high blood pressure. You have a little bit, your body temperature is higher. That's why some of the women in menopause period they feel more hot flashes around evening time because melatonin starts to pick the body temperature, but it's still low. Body temperature is actually going to go up. And then this cycle continues 24 hours. 
And it seems that this cycle is continuing for a million years of human actually living in this planet. Well, melatonin has a definitely a big event on the body function, definitely on the temperature, definitely has a big things on hormonal. We know that. That's why I explained to you, even for hormonal things, estrogen and progesterone, which is very, very important for women, that's exactly the goal to the brain circadian rhythm. Obesity, you have a lot of things. I don't have a time to talk about it, but we know as at least we have the, the habit of eating. In, in, the, in the mouse, we know, like, if, for example, if we discipline the mouse to eat only during the day and not eating at the night time, when they actually the bodies go to the brain circadian, they have more, less weight gain. But if we have a mouse, we actually, we, we actually feeding them around the evening time and night time, they actually have more weight gain. That's exactly the reason that people say, do not eat heavy, heavily on the evening time and night time because you actually gain more of the calories that you're taking. You can have the same amount of the food during the day, but you're actually able to uh, handle it much better. Increase of diabetes and depression, I don't want to go on details, I just, but you know that the people work on the shift work. This is what we call shift work disorder. This is a different topic we talk, but the people working in the night flow, they, they have a more chance to have diabetes and also obesity and increased weight as well. And that's why it's very important for people actually working at night to have a very good body exercise during the day to compensate this, this amount of the things happening there um, in, in there. And again, definitely has effect on depression. Then we talk about it. We have seasonal affective disorder. I'm sure you hear about it. Some people are getting more depressed in the fall time and winter time in compared to the springtime and summertime. And that's something that also we have to notice. Now, based on that, we have some people that they have delayed sleep phase disorder. And that's the people that actually usually go twos up two hours later to, to the bed, is the actually evening type people. They work more in the nighttime. Young people, teenagers, they are the people. I have one of my friends actually complaining about his teenager that actually always wanted to sleep around like 12 a.m. and wake up around 10, 11 a.m. And I said, well, that's fine. This is the way the brain circadian rhythm is. They have delayed phase disorder. And again, uh, very family history is actually big things. As you see on this picture, the person has a melatonin peak around the midnight, not around 7 p.m. That's why it's actually 11 p.m., 12 a.m., or 1 a.m. This is the time they feel very drowsy. On some people, they have advanced sleep phase disorder. A lot of people with aging population, they actually have this. What happens is they are morning type people. They are the people who wake up at 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the morning, and they always come and complain, I don't know why I wake up always 4 o'clock in the morning. I wish I could sleep more. But what happens is actually the melatonin peak is actually around the 6 p.m. They go up on the peak around midnight, go up, go down so quickly, that's why around the 4 a.m. their body is going to wake up. And that's why I told you the melatonin is a time messenger. And again, this, these people are usually starting from middle age, 50 years, and when we aging more, our body go to more advanced sleep disorder. Now, but dementia people, and a lot of other things, they have irregular sleep-wake rhythm. That's why I talked to you about that. If you look at the delayed sleep phase on the top, it usually goes like 4 a.m., they just go to the bed, they wake up at 12 p.m., a lot of young people like that, People on the college like that, but a lot of the, the old people they go around at 5 p.m. and they wake up around like 3 a.m. And then some of the people have the, which is especially irregular sleep wake rhythm, as you see on the picture, or your dementia patient, they are on this brain circadian rhythm disorder. They're very, very irregular. They sleep for one or two hours, they wake up for a long time, you see another blue, they actually wake, they sleep around like 9 p.m. and they again wake up around 11 p.m. and this cycle is going to be continued. Even some of the sleep uh, uh, problem with dementia patient is a non-24 hour sleep waking rhythm. That means they have no actually normal rhythm for a sleep that happened, that, that happened in these people. But why? Why the people with dementia? They have irregular sleep wake rhythm. That's why you guys wanted to know. The lot of things is, first of all, as you remember, I told you about SCN or suprachiasmatic nuclear that we have. They're actually going to lose it off this neurons when we have all this either amyloid things is happen, even tau is going to happen in the brain. They're losing the function or neurons that actually is responsible for that. 
The, all, the other things that happen, again, because of the lot of the amyloid and other things that happen in them, that's why they have this problem. And they, 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 this SCN, which is a very important part of getting the message from retina and sending to the cones in the brain to produce their natural melatonin, that doesn't work for them. And the other thing is they have a less eye transmission. A lot of dementia patients, they are in the old age, they have cataract, they already have glaucoma, they have macular degeneration, and they don't get the light easily to their eye to go to the brain and make this circadian rhythm um, intact. And the other thing is low melatonin receptors in all of them because of this change. Very interesting thing, MT1 receptor is a melatonin receptor in the body, and it's, it's actually these receptors <coughs> For some of the things that study has been, there's a tons of, there's a couple of the articles in the last couple of years, but it's about this receptor, it's getting dysregulated. And what does it mean? That's why dementia patients, they do not respond to melatonin supplement very well. Because that receptor is not working in them. And that's one of the questions you may ask me. And again, 50% drop in overall the brain circadian, the 24 hours of the human that I talked to you, they're not going to have this rhythm, beautiful circle anymore. Environmental, and again, psychosocial things that happen. One of the major things is no light. Majority of the dementia patients, they're living indoors. They're living inside the walls. They don't go out. Think about human as a nature. We have been hunter and gatherer people. We either working on the, or even in, in the next life that we become agricultural, we always stay in the farm during the day and going to or a small village or a small house at the evening time. That was the normal brain supposed to be. That's why if you still go to the farm, the farmer people, they don't take ambient. They don't take melatonin. Because they are very well now about the brain circadian rhythm. They're working during the day outside, and when it comes dark, they go inside and they sleep very well. They don't have any electronic life. They don't have a TV. They don't have all these things that we have. They, that's why they know they have a time to sleep. They have, there's a time for them to, to wake up. The other thing is a lack of physical activity. Definitely, it's a, one of the things that we should know. The physical activity on this brain circadian rhythm has a big effect. Lack of social interaction. And that's a very, very important because part of the brain that we talk is not only about melatonin, it's also talk about other neurotransmitters in the brain, including dopamine, serotonin, that all you guys knowing about them, but that's also that they need the social interaction as them. Noise, somebody says about noise, I told you, they have a very uh, more stage one sleep on their cycle. That's why they're very, very sensitive to the noise. And they actually, there is a light at the nighttime, majority of our memory centers, we have been using a lot of lights because we wanted the caregivers see that. Is this normal for the natural of the brain? No. Not so good. Think, always think about, we were being hunter-gatherer people, and we're supposed to only be during the daytime exposed to the light, nighttime we should be on the darkness. And again, medication, medication and medication. And we'll talk about it then. Depression and anxiety, definitely has also effect on environmental and psychosocial. What about medication? Unfortunately, a lot of medication that I, as a doctor, prescribe for people, actually I make them worse on the sleep cycle. The best example on that is diuretic. And actually, a lot of the dementia patients on either um, one of the blood pressure medication, the one mechanism of this blood pressure medication is induce more urine. And that's why a lot of times they end up to have more urination. With some of them, we actually they have leg swelling and other things we actually give them during the day diuretic. They're going to have a urination at night, and that's definitely is interfered with the sleep cycle. Alcohol. Alcohol has a big effect on their sleep brain circadian rhythm. I'm telling you, the alcohol is actually cause more confusion on this brain circadian rhythm. Alcohol is not a good sleeping aid. It makes you to become more drowsy jumping to a stage two or three so quickly, but your rapid eye movement is going to be more closer cycle. That's why uh, people with alcohol, they either have fragmented sleep sometime, or even if they have a very deep sleep at night, they have more snoring. Or when they wake up in the morning, they still may feel drowsy, because your body was not able to get enough sleep at night time. Now, alcohol definitely. Antidepressant medication that we prescribe to treat depression, which is a depression is one of the triggers for sleep, actually cause lower rapid eye movement phase, which already they're suffering from that. 
And, it's, and I'm not saying that uh, antidepressant medication is bad, but I just wanted to say it's very important if you have dementia a patient and is suffering from sleep problem, think about what kind of antidepressant medication you're using, because definitely some of them they can have effect on the rapid eye movement. Alpha or beta blocker, definitely anything that we use, beta blocker or alpha blocker, because they actually have effect on autonomic system. They may have level, I mean, we use a lot of cinnamon for Parkinson people, or people have blue body with Parkinsonism, or they have a dementia, later they have like a Parkinson picture, definitely cause more daytime sleepiness. It's one of the major complaints the Parkinson people they have, they always feel sleepy. Actually, the Parkinson medication makes them to be more sleepy during daytime. And again, a lot of bronchodilator, some of them they are asthmatic or they have COPD, and they use inhaler later of the day. Inhaler cause more insomnia, and that's something that we should do, think about. And again, using any stimulant, I put a tea or caffeine or any caffeine beverages, any um, retinol, Provigil, or anything we use. And again, um, the other thing is cold medication which is, I will say, cold medication, all the antihistamine, especially PM medication, Tylenol PM, Advil PM, they always cause a sleep latency as well. And again, H2 blocker, which is we use it for a stomach problem, like rhinitidine or cymetidine or, 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 any, or famotidine or pepsid, they actually may cause insomnia. Additional behavioral problem is happening in a sleep dementia people is they may have restless leg syndrome more in people they have Parkinson picture. And as you know, restless leg is very annoying um, symptoms. They have to urge to move, and they have or they may have to massage their legs. But in dementia patient, if they have it, they're not able to do that. They just scream. They just feel uncomfortable. They're getting out of bed. They wanted to wandering around. But you're kind of like questioning about why is that? Restless leg could be one of them. And again, I want to tell you, the restless leg is actually getting worse with a lot of medication that we're offering to them. Antidepressant makes it worse. Any of SSRI, SNRI actually makes the stress less like worse. A lot of the PM medication, Tylenol PM, Advil PM, all this PM antihistamine makes it worse. Um, Anti-nausea medication makes it worse. Um, the stomach medication they use makes the rest less like worse. Anemia also is very important to check the iron level. Some of them, they have periodic limb movement. They, they move in a lot and inside the bed. More happening in the Parkinson, Lewy body dementia. And I told you, REM behavioral sleep disorder. It's one of the very, and that's exactly the picture of REM behavioral sleep disorder. Think about he was a boxer when he was, he was younger, but the, the consequence is always punching his wife inside the bed. The major complaint that we hear a lot in the Parkinson people because they're, they're not able to get paralyzed in their body. Excessive daytime sleepiness, a lot of time we hear about that. This is another problem happening in dementia patients. They're always sleepy, they're always asleep. I, I hear this complaint from a lot of the children of my patient. Ask me about, can you give some stimulant to them to make them awake? And, and, and that's true, they ask me about this question. But the dementia patient, they have more excessive daytime sleepiness. More especially if they have Parkinson picture or they have Lewy body as well. And again, a lot of things can happen in the um, um, Alzheimer patient that they may have this picture as well. One of them is use any sedative at night. And the reason of sedative at night, I don't have time to talk about it. You may actually hear some of my talk about polypharmacy, sleep medication, how our body metabolism is. But when, especially when we get demented or liver, is not able to metabolize and clear a lot of medication so easily. That's why we have a hard time to excrete this medication from our kidney. It's staying for a long time in your system. You may take Ambien for yourself at 8 p.m., go to bed at 10 p.m., sleep very well, wake up at 6, but if you give the same, I'm not saying Ambien, please, I don't want anybody fight. I don't want, I've already been in the blacklist for pharmaceutical companies, but I'm just saying any sleeping day. Um, 8 p.m., if you give to dementia patient, don't expect that this medication is going to be cleared from the body at 6 o'clock in the morning. You have to expect that it's going to stay for the next day as well. Um, any sedative or not, any dopamine agent, people have Parkinson, we treat them for Parkinson's disease, they have excessive, I told you about that, but then we have to have a, a balance between what we're given to them. Depression um, is one of the reasons for excessive time as, as well. 
The problem is we treat them with depression. They may have some problem in the rem. So tricky to manage that. And that's why it's very challenging for all also physicians. Sleep apnea, I told you, especially in vascular dementia, Alzheimer people also, they're increased risk of sleep apnea. But good luck to have an Alzheimer patient and convince them to have a CPAP machine at night. <laughs> I have a problem with my non-demented patient, but I don't know what we can do, but they have a lot of a sleep apnea as well. Lack of engaging activities also causes excessive daytime sleepiness. And cardiovascular, I mean, the caregiver actually, I see a lot, they may feel if they have dementia patients better to sleep during the day, they're able to do other stuff. That's why they encourage or they ask the doctor to give more sleeping medication, mm -hmm. that that's actually helped them because it's going to be less burden on the caregiver sometimes. How to evaluate that is another thing. It's, first of all, it's, it's, it's a complicated thing, so I told you, because it's very hard. I told you the majority of time it's a report coming from caregiver when you ask directly of the patient, so they have no idea if they sleep or not. But again, there's no uh, criteria that it's been in the multi, if you look at the, all the disciplines, in European, Asia, the United States, all the societies, do they have any question or all this stuff? Not routinely, but I think the best way is routinely ask caregiver or partner about some question. The first question is, is what is the total of sleeping time? I told you about two cases. Put it the number, having the pencil and one paper, and write it up that your patient, how many hours in 24 hours, getting either nap on the coach, or, or even on the wheelchair, or in the bed. Calculate all the time of the nap and the sleep. You have an idea that how many hours they sleep. They may sleep 12 hours. And it's okay, there's no insomnia problem. It's all about irregular sleep-awake cycle. And is it something that I should treat it? That we will talk about. And again, problem with falling asleep. If the person has a problem to falling asleep, how long it takes? That's the question you ask. How often they actually wake up at night? This is all the question you need to kind of look looking at and write it up and bring it also to doctors that they have better idea what's going on at night. Any unusual behavior at night, screaming, wandering, or agitation, or a moving of the legs, moving of the hands, anything's happened, you have to know about that. Feel a sleepy and tired during the day. That's a very important report. You need to write it up on your questionnaire. Did I see that? How many naps? Is it the planned naps? Or is it all the unplanned naps? This is very important to write it up as well. And any medication, including over-the-counter, any antihistamine, any PM medication that we use, and questioning about, again, periodic leap movement, restless leg syndrome, kicking, or any other things, and question about a snoring can also help you or the doctor to be dealing with the sleep apnea as well. If the problem is falling in the sleep is staying, the next step for you is what is the time of the sleep in the 24 hours? The question is if timing is very unusual. Think about your patient is asleep at the daytime, go early to the bed, or very late. We definitely have circadian brain disorder, or we have irregular awake, sleeping awake rhythm. That's the two diagnoses that we have then the problem is with that, the red circadian brain rhythm. But if there's no problem with timing, then it's definitely there's something else is going on. There's no problem with brain red circadian rhythm. Probably if there is restless leg or insomnia disorder, there is something environmental that is causing them to have a sleep problem. There should be a medical reason. Maybe they are in pain. Maybe the arthritis is actually getting worse every time when they're lying in bed. When we turn to the left, maybe the left knee, which is hurting, is start to pain, and that's what's causing the pain. That's going to be a good hand of the doctor to examine dementia patient and put in the hands on the knee or on the hip to see if there's any sore spot on that, or you can also find it out, or, or any psychiatry, any medication that we talk about it. And that means that you have evaluation. How can I differentiate what's the problem with my patient? If there is excessive daytime sleepiness, your next step is assessment of timing and quantity of the sleep. What you need to do, if you're still your timing is very unusual, you think about, okay, this is definitely a brain circadian disorder again, or maybe again, irregular sleep or wake rhythm. But if the timing is normal, I probably have to say, does the patient have adequate sleep duration? And again, if no, with adequate sleep duration, just think about a sleep apnea as well. And that's going to be kind of things that you, you can find, you can evaluate your patient about what they Now, circadian brain disorder, I'm uh, getting very good at time. Okay. 
be good. No, um, I can talk to you until evening. But <laughs> circadian brain disorder, it's having a treatment. And there's two treatment is actually going to be either light or light therapy. I, I can't go on the details on that. But again, uh, uh, we have some of the uh, articles has been published. I can't tell you how many articles. Majority of this article are published in Asia. I actually see South Korean people and Japanese people. They're very, very interested on that. Recently, I see some articles from Poland as well, Netherlands, and I, I see also some articles from UK as well um, is publishing more. They do more working on the light therapy and effects on the sleep. But one of the things is one of the famous study that it actually happened to 36 people that actually in Alzheimer's memory unit. And they actually start to get education with caregiver, even do daily exercise plus 60 minutes of bright light therapy, or again for two months. At two months, the treatment group significantly showed that they have reduction in the number of nighttime sleep awakening, total time of awake at night. There is less depression in compared to the control group. When they follow the study for six months, they definitely said that all the sleep parameters actually improved in the group that they actually had the bright light therapy. Famous study has been done. And there's a tons of other studies. If you are so interested, there's a lot of also discussion. You can go in on the doctor Google and just put it on the bright therapy dementia patient. You see a lot of people around the world, they're talking about that. Has effect on anxiety? Yes, definitely. There are a lot of, and one of the major studies, like the Torpus study shows, just half an hour exposure to the light, which is Lux is actually the unit for the light. If it's morning light, which I say 10 a.m., 11 a.m., probably in the Pacific time, it's going to be the best time. This definitely has effect on, I mean, a lot of the um, aggressive behavior on the dementia patient. And again, especially if the study done in the vascular dementia, and it shows it's really, really helpful. Um, the other study actually shows that if they have Alzheimer patient to the bright light therapy, just only 2,500 lux, and again, a different value time of the day, definitely has effect on aggressive behavior as well. And again, there is a morning light that was more effective than afternoon light in a lot of them. Some of the tips that you may actually know about that, the first of all, light therapy is not going to be overnight. If you either put them in outside or, or, or expose them to the light outside of the memory care at home, or you actually um, do it in like, uh, for example, um, light, bright light therapy with the light therapy that you can buy for any store, I think it's like 60, 70, uh, $60, maybe $70 uh, for light therapy, but it takes a long time. The other thing is a lot of people think we have a lot of windows inside our building. And actually, the, the windows, it shows that you're not getting enough the light through the windows. Because it's very important, this daylight level is actually dropped quickly when you have a distance. Three to four meters away from the window, the actually the, the, the daylight is going to be quite low, even on the very sunny days. And again, because of a lot of discomfort, or, or, or architectural people, they actually make the windows a little bit dark. We put blinds, we put shades. And then, to be honest with you, Right now, we don't get any light, just in this room. And because, again, this is the way that we design. And this is exactly against a natural grain. Just always think, farmer life, hunter gatherer life. Then you can have the answer to a lot of that question. Um, some of the other things that I wanted to tell you about, same things that you do with the toddler, you need to do with them. And again, um, it's very, very important to, uh, I want to tell you about it because Again, try to do calm things in the evening time and calm activities as well and avoid the low, low noise as well. I'm always putting on, because we have a less time to talk about it, is a memory care unit, no party, no station, and a lot of things, smelling of ca caffeine or coffee at the nighttime definitely should be one of the things. It always should be quiet as like a library. That's why I'm just saying in all the memory center, no TV or radio definitely is important. And decrease the stimulation um, for hallucination. Definitely try to not using any bright colors or any bold, pa I mean, bold patterns because it makes the hallucination more. And again, do not make room so bright that there's going to be a glare. Always avoid any things. I can say in my son, if you if you watch any cartoon that has a lot of activity, he gets a sleep problem at night. This is two years old. But definitely, there's nothing. No Halloween in your skill nursing because they're not able to differentiate between reality and fun. Temperature is very important. Always I'm asked to move the mirror from the bedroom because if they can always hallucinate, you're not able to understand the, the, the reality. 
Um, night light it should be kind of a three piece, sometimes promoted by the bed is going to be helpful. And make sure everything is very familiar. Avoid having the daytime clothing because they're not able to understand this is the nighttime to sleep. And again, try to always getting some exercise during the day. Maybe playing some radio at the nighttime will be helpful. Preparing them for the night, and that's a very, very important thing. If they are wandering and refusing to go to the bed, let them to have a sleeping in the couch. If the person wanders at night, that's okay. If as the environment is safe, let them to walk around because they have the regular sleep cycle. If they have a pain, try to not, uh, uh, sometimes you can use some of the Tylenol at nighttime. I just wanted to in one second tell you about for pharmacologically, we have, there is no medication actually help for them. A lot of the medication actually, if you want to use it just for two or three weeks, never use every night. Use intermittent like every other day if you want to gradually taper it down. And again, the final conclusion I wanted to tell you that is first step is evaluation, evaluation, find the triggering cause, and again, fourth is use medication only for temporary. There is no change overnight, and it will fluctuate. Now, beside of that, I want to have two minutes quickly. Uh, this is my closing remarks that I have it in first thing I have need this conference, but because this is circle of care, I call it circle of care, but I read it in a couple of occasions. I wanted to, in a couple of minutes, just read it quickly, and I'm very happy to answer your question for you next. And this is the, this is Gustav Klein. I call it circle of life. A large painting death of life created in 1910 features not a personal death, but rather merely an allegory called Green Reaper, who gazed alive with a malicious green. This life is comprised for all generations. Every age group is represented from baby to the grandmother. In this picture of never-ending circle of life, death may be able to swipe individuals from life, but life itself, humanity as a whole, will always elude his grasp. This circle of life likewise represents itself in diverse, wonderful, pastel color, circular ornament, which adorn life like a garland. Or son Sam born two years ago. It was literally heartwarming and fascinating how excited her family members, friends, colleagues, and mostly all the patients became. Everybody featured to help. Anyone who knows had a baby, how much hard work and dedication goes into the process. However, nobody minds the constant cries, staying all up at night to attend the baby needs, changing the diapers and getting pee and poop on themselves. We actually enjoy it and find it very enriching. So babies are great, but as people, we all, we're getting old, we also need more attention, care, support, and love. Do we as a society give them as the same level of attention, devotion, and dedication? And this subject often stirs emotional feeling on me. What will happen to Sam when he's old and frail, frail and my wife and I are no longer around to take care of him? Will the caregiver attend to his need as, he, as, he, as we boo? Will they check the temperature of water before bathing him? Will they feed him and clean him with dignity and love? Will they hug him, sit with him, and hold his hand when he's sad, upset, or sundowning? Will they truly care of him? I ended up crying every time this train of thoughts haunts me as I'm not sure about the answer to all this question. A few years ago, I was attending to my patient in a nursing home. I came across of elderly sitting quietly in the wheelchair looking sad, helpless and frail. People around them moving fast, trying to get their jobs done for a day, as thought the senior were invisible and already gone. I imagine how sad their parents and loved ones will feel if they remain around, how they beg the caregivers, nurses, and me as their doctor to take care of their loved one. If Gustav Klimt was alive, I asked him to make a new painting for me and call it Circle of Care, showing that this circle will go generation by generation and he's never going to die. And instead of Green Reaper, I will put a symbol of love and kindness. And in my fatherhood life, I hope that my son Sam will learn one lesson, only one lesson from me that his father never found anything more valuable than caring for others in this life, helping elders to alleviate their pain and aches and accompany them with the last station of life with dignity and love and respect with knowing this fact that his father will be in his last station of life one. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think we don't have any time for questions. I think you guys are going to be thinking for your... Five minutes. Five minutes, okay, wonderful. Thank you.
Now, I was so quick on some of the tips about that, but I'm going to be happy to kind of tell you if you need more details on that. Please, sir. Uh, as a caregiver, what's the best way to manage a uh, Alzheimer's patient who has already have a habituation issue with, uh, say, IMB? I'm sorry, can you repeat again your question? As a caregiver? As a caregiver, what's the best way to manage an Alzheimer's patient, uh -huh. my mother, right. who's already has a habituation or addicted to ambient. So, I mean, well, that's a great question. Actually, I wanted to tell you that if somebody's brain is all because ambient is exactly like lorazepam or diazepam, they're a double receptor, but they are on, on the different part of the gap, but they work on the same centers of the brain GABA receptor. I want to tell you about this is going to be go to the, the, the I mean, definition of personalized medicine. I Means some people especially aging people, they actually uh, respond better to this kind of medication and compare to people in Western because they have enzyme able to metabolize this medication. Mm -hmm. Now, what I say that if somebody really getting ambient and getting enough of sleep, I'd never actually stop that because it seems the brain is adjusted to that. Actually, if we stop the ambient, we'll see withdrawal and then we're going to have a more symptoms. If we have this, I don't bother for that. You may ask a question, okay, my mother has already has a severe Alzheimer's dementia. I know the ambient in the long term can cause some cognitive decline, especially with the new studies and all this stuff. Weight risk and benefit, benefit and goals of care. I don't care. I said, well, that's, that's the last stage of dementia. If she's happy with ambient, enjoy it. <laughs> and just let her to have the ambient. But if somebody has a problem with ambient, then I will say, okay, let's think about the difference. I do not change it. And the stopping is actually going to be more harmful. Please. No more questions? You're all, please, yes. Um, what do you think about oral melatonin? Good. Oral melatonin is none of this study has been shown. I mean, I will so quickly on that. But none of this study shows oral melatonin is effective on dementia patients. There is only one single study just recently published about high dose of melatonin. The effect, it's not very well accepted actually for people. None of the romelton, which is a melatonin receptor agonist or melatonin showing that the dementia people has any effect on a sleep, unfortunately, because of the effects on the receptor. There is some study shows in Netherlands, they, they, they did the light therapy and melatonin supplement at the same time. And they have some, some, some numbers that actually is, we should consider that, it's okay, maybe combination of light therapy will work. But I will tell you that if somebody asks me of one single medication, there's no one single medication. The only medication has a little bit, a little bit more um, numbers actually that better than on the papers is trazodone because of the serotonin agonist. Helping a little bit with the sleep structure um, doesn't have the habitual effect of the, I mean, that you have to take for a long time. The only things for trazodone, you have to be very careful. It caused drop in the blood pressure if they're changing their position. We call orthostatic hypertension. That's why if they are wandering a lot at night, I'm kind of like shaking when I give a trazodone because I'm just worried about they're not going to have a fall. But none of the medication actually, none of the plan showing that has any effect on the dementia patient, not even melatonin receptor. I mean, the, uh, the supplements. So how high is the dose? The dose is, I mean, the dose is starting is three milligram, go to six milligram. Some of the people actually said we may add another three milligram to six milligram on the top. But to be honest with you, melatonin also can cause in this in the supplement wise, it cause drowsiness and also increased risk of fall at night. And that's why I I do not. I mean, as a geriatrician, I actually if I see no benefit of melatonin, first of all, I do not apply melatonin. I don't prescribe melatonin for my dementia patient. I'm kind of like stepping back on the melatonin. But if I wanted to do it, if I don't see any effect after six milligram, I either stop it and I don't go up on the dose. Zero minutes. That means we're done. <laughs> <laughs> the minutes we've gone out of here. I'm sorry. You guys have a lot of questions.